a very hard act to follow. Now, I'm going to go um, a bit back in a way with my talk. I wanted to focus, as Maria focused, uh, more on the Jungian perspective and on the archetypal. I wanted to focus more on what actually happens uh, on the physical and mental if we have an experience which um, is not integrated or hasn't, in a way, come to a, a solution within the psychedelic experience. So um, the encounter with the Chakua, uh, the Chakua is, in a way, um, traditionally the ruler of the underworld. It is a night symbol in South America. It represents power and ferocity. And it is a symbol of our shadow forces, of our fears, but also how we can overcome them. And I think that is quite important to see both sides here. Because encounters with the Chakua are very, very frightening. But also, the energy of the Chakua, the ferocity, and the standing power it has can help us to overcome them. So, in shamanism, we have always known that plant medicines are dissolute boundaries, that they access, that we get access to experiences which are way out of the ordinary, to new levels of perception and new levels of consciousness, or in shamanic terms, of course, to the other worlds, to the spirit worlds. And this is now not a forum to discuss what's what, what we call the collective unconscious, what are the spirit worlds, and so on. Um, this is a long discussion, but in shamanic terms, it would be the spirit worlds. Now, contemporary research also shows us that plant medicine like ayahuasca, ibogaine, but also mushrooms dissolve boundaries between our brain regions, which works, of course, for those of you who are psychologically trained, directly against dissociation. So what we are actually suppressing, be it via dissociation, that we put a boundary around it somehow and don't uh, integrate it and don't let it grow up, whatever it was, starts to dissolve. Um, it also decreases what we know from contemporary research. It decreases the activity in our default mode regions. So that's where we kind of hold those fixed patterns of how we act and how we react and how we think about something. So those fixed patterns, which actually we need them in daily life to function in a way, they can start to dissolve. So we are seeing it with new eyes. We, it's almost like, uh, but also on the dark side, the shadow side, we actually don't know what's happening. We don't know how we should react. So this is another component. It increases, it seems, with the, the research is, is very vague. Like fMRI is not a precise science yet. Let's uh, not kid ourselves here. It increases activity in the regions that are associated with the transpersonal in our brain. So in a way, what indigenous cultures knew for a long, long time, without having fMRI scans at all, uh, science is slowly uh, looking into what is actually happening in the brain. Now, taking this into account, we need to, of course, understand that we will have shadow encounters. There is just no way around it. If anybody says that every experience we have with a plant medicine will be positive or will be integrated in the end, is actually lying to you. Because what happens in the brain points clearly in the direction that the dissolution of the boundaries will bring up, as Maria said, unconscious material, at least unconscious material. So our shadow encounters will, on the whole, be uh, on two levels. They can be on a, of a personal nature that actually subconsciously held material comes up, or on a transpersonal nature that ma material from the co collective uh, unconscious or the collective psyche out there is perceived, and as shamans would say, from the spirit world. So we are getting uh, dark forces uh, coming in. And both of those can bring up states of fear or even terror. Uh, it's not just fear, it can go further. 
Usually, in the right setting, with the right people around, with experienced curanderos or shamans, with the right doses, in the right environment, blah, 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 where you have time to integrate afterwards, which is health and so on, um, the plant medicine will do its work. These fear and steroid states are usually processed and brought to adaptive conclusions. That doesn't mean that they are fully integrated, but at least they are brought to adaptive conclusions and you walk out and you're actually okay. Nevertheless, a minority of people experience this quite disturbing aftermath on after effects and I want to have a look at those. Um, this is actually, uh, I, for time reasons, I only give you a few examples. Now, this is an example out of my practice, uh, a guy called Tony. He had three ayahuasca ceremonies in the, in the UK. Uh, he was absolutely fine until about a week after when she's, he started to have sleep disturbances, nightmares where he was chased and attacked by wild animals. Chuck here was the, the main attacker here, uh, as well as humans. He had panic attacks out of the blue, which started to increase and the subconscious material, um, he uh, in, was increase, increasingly flooded with childhood memories. And they were all of a traumatic nature. Now, he had always known that he had a traumatic childhood. Yeah, this wasn't a uh, 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 kind of resurfing memories out of the blue, but he had avoided them. So he alternated between being anxious and having panic attacks, and then uh, between being unreal and detached. Throughout that whole process, he cried a lot, and that brought actually temporary uh, release. Now, what do we do in our country, and what do people do? They go to the doctor. And what happens? We are pres prescribed medication. And as, he, as the anxiety was the pre anxiety and panic attack was the predominantly symptoms, he was prescribed uh, anti-anxiety medication. His main states were feelings of helplessness and confusion. Now, the next one is important, but he had massive insight. He was absolutely and crystal clear about one thing, that this was a necessary period in his life, that he needed to go through this to finally and forever let go of all the stuff that comes from his childhood. So it's, it's quite important to acknowledge this because people who go through these traumatic states, and traumatic states, they are traumatic, I want to come to that in a moment, they actually usually understand in a way what is happening, but they don't know how to do it because it is so emotional and it is so physical. Those of you who have ever had a full-blown panic attack know how frightening it is. No, the heart starts racing, you're sweating, you're trembling, you, you think you might be dying. So it is very frightening stuff. Okay, another example, I give you three, is Emma. I have, um, she had uh, eight ceremonies in Peru uh, over three years. Huge development, positive, all positive, until the crisis ceremony happened, where she was in the ceremony already had severe panics, feelings of paranoia, St very strong visual hallucinations, which are quite normal, but she also felt catatonic for the first time, so she couldn't move and she couldn't talk, and she couldn't communicate at all. Afterwards, and for several weeks to follow the ceremony, she felt a loss of personal boundaries. She believed, and she felt it, that she experienced other people's depression and anxiety. Of course, that then led her to become acrophobic. She couldn't leave the house anymore because she was picking up all the vibes from her environment. She then fell into a deep depression and had suicidal thoughts. Now, she went also to a psychologist. She also went to the normal uh, services. And I'll want to say something about that in a moment. And they diagnosed a massive depressive disorder with psychotic tendency induced by ayahuasca. Exactly. I can see your face back there. Exactly. No? But that's what we do. That is what we do here. And believe me, if you are in that state, you're desperate. You're absolutely desperate. As uh, Maria said, this overwhelms the conscious, but it also overwhelms the body. 
it's very, very frightening physically. That's why I wanted to go back to it. I mean, we can talk about archetypes, but what happens actually on the physical, emotional level brings people to, in the end, look for psychiatric help, and then they get put on medication and diagnosed, basically, like she, psychotic tendency. No. She rejected the diagnosis because she also was aware that this was an important phase she needed to go through. And as she worked through it, as she began to integrate it, and it did take time, it did take time, uh, she had tremendous spiritual insights and tremendous healings and realized that there was a calling. She then became a clinician and uh, it was fine, but it took time. And the last example, before I then go into a bit more um, what do we actually do, is Sophie. She had over 30 ayahuasca ceremonies over six years. And uh, she had a very large dose of ayahuasca, and she was so far out, according to her own reporting, that she also was catatonic. Uh, but she was at a relatively advanced state, if I can categorize it like this. Um, she was able to observe the situation while she was in there, and she remembers thinking, um, this is how dying must feel. Now, this is okay when you're on ayahuasca, because you're still going through it all. But if you take that dying idea back into your ordinary life, it becomes very, very disturbing. So, she reported that she crashed straight after, and that ever since she had felt hem empty, hopeless, disinterested in her job, in her family, and herself. She understood for the first time how somebody must feel who would rather commit suicide than live. She also rejected the medication she was offered. And she also felt that this was meant to happen. And that this experience, and that's what happened, would bring a whole change of herself in her life. And that is exactly what happened. So if we look at all those three experiences, we can see that all of them brought about high states of anxiety, that all of them were diagnosed as either anxiety disorder or even psychosis, and that all of them needed help. Now, what I didn't mention here is that none of them wanted to go back and have another ayahuasca session at this moment in time. Now, it could have been, and we can speculate about this, it could have been that another ayahuasca session would actually have solved something. But if you are in a state like that, if you are in a crisis state like this, the last thing you want to do is actually to go back to doing something or taking something which brought on the crisis. So what is there on offer now? Before I go into what we can do here and uh, how we can actually define what's happening here to these people, I want to briefly look at what indigenous uh, communities would say, would do, and so on. So, we need to see that from an indigenous world point of view, from a shamanic point of view, uh, to, to use this simplification, a period like this would be seen as a necessary stage to move from one level of consciousness to another. And that during those periods, when these shifts take place, they are called initiation periods, that they are usually marked by spiritual or psycho-spiritual crisis and often by physical illness. When I researched for my first book, I looked into um, initiation periods with, in, within traditional shamanism. And from, well, basically from uh, the Americas over Mongolia, all the way to the Far East, the experiences were very similar. The experiences always, or most of the time, included a severe physical illness. Of course, hearing voices. This member experiences, I went through one of those myself, and it was one of the most frightening things I have ever experienced. Being attacked by spirits, being out of the body, near-death experiences, that is, the initiate really thought they would be dying. And very importantly, we don't mention that usually when we glorify shamanism, and I love shamanism, believe me. But when we glorify it, we very rarely uh, say that 
they all describe as being very frightened and being very confused about realities. So, in a way, all three of them, and especially the last two of my examples, we can say that they are going through a so-called transformational experience. And these transformations, as um, Maria already said, they take time. They are processes through which the person in evolves. That's how it's seen in indigenous communities. The old ways of thinking, perceiving, feeling, and being, they break down. The brain restructures. And old belief systems are quite often shattered. In indigenous uh, communities, a person going through such experiences quite often emerges as a very powerful shaman. Now, uh, because before I go on, 15, before I go on with indigenous uh, communities, I want to interfere with Jung, who said, there is no coming to consciousness without pain, and this is now directly against the New Age community. I, I love to bring Jung there. There is no coming to consciousness without pain. People will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own soul. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Now, if you go through an experience like I have just described, the aftermath of ayahuasca experiences like this, you have no choice anymore. You have no choice. You can't run away. This is what's happening, and it's strong. So in indigenous traditional uh, communities, of course, the setting and world views uh, support such transformational spaces, uh, processes. Firstly, there is the positive integration, or uh, positive interpretation. So if you go through something like this, it's actually seen as something positive. You are moving from one level of consciousness to another. Not like here, where you see a doctor and they put you on, uh, on medication and diagnose uh, you with uh, paranoia. No? And that really helps. If something is seen as positive, it helps hugely. Um, so they see, see such experiences as a spiritual transition process from one level of consciousness to another. An indigenous community also will hold the initiate. They will hold them. It's a holding environment which we can't offer people. And this is something for the psychedelic community to really look at. We need holding spaces. Desperately. How do they hold? They look after them. They get fed, they get watered, they get looked after so that they can tr go through what they need to go through. Here, we have a job, we have kids, we are, and so on and so on. You know what's happening here. No. So, so, because lots of these processes actually process themselves to a certain extent, at least, if you are giving a holding environment. Now, we also have, of course, a traditional know-how, as Maria already uh, said, and knowledge. They have done that forever, so they know more about it than we. We have to uh, begin to actually get that knowledge. And a very important part is they have mentors. Everybody who goes through a so-called initiation crisis uh, in indigenous community will have an experienced shaman to go through these crises with them. They have gone through it themselves. They know how to navigate those planes whether we call them the collective unconscious or our own subconscious or the spiritual world, they have a lot of understanding about these different planes of consciousness. They have maps of the spirit world, so they know how to navigate through those. And last but not least, the community will support the ceremonies, rituals, prayers, and other means, energetic means. So you are really held. And with that, you can go through such experiences. Um, this picture for me always uh, showed that. This is a shaman, a Mongolian shaman, the picture was all over the internet, who comes just down from a spirit procession trip. And look how she holds him. There is an absolute love and understanding there. What is actually going on in him? This is pure and utter knowing love, I think. And it's beautiful. No? And so if you can create that environment, that makes it so much easier. So, okay, coming, coming, um, because I have to hurry. How much have you got? Seven minutes? Eight? <laughs> Nine? <laughs>
I give you 100 million per six MP. And <laughs> no, okay, six and a half. <laughs> okay. Um, now, looking at those cases, I would like to introduce you to two concepts which one needs to kind of be familiar with. Especially the last two cases show clear signs of a spiritual emergency, but also a spiritual emergence. And Croft did a very good uh, definition, and I don't need to read it all, but it is basically a crisis process. Uh, it's a process of growth and change which becomes chaotic and overwhelming. And people who go through those processes really feel that all that they are breaking down, like the last two in my examples do. Um, and they feel tremendous anxiety, have difficulty coping with their daily lives, jobs, and so on, and or even fear for their own sanity. I had that when I went through a dismemberment experience. I thought, this is it. My brain is so fragile, uh, anything to tip me over. But we also need to understand the spiritual emergency idea only covers one area. I personally think that there is also trauma a traumatic response involved. All of those cases show responses which we can expect when people go through a traumatic experience. And it is a situation where the person is exposed to death, perceives a threat or actual injury, or perceives a threat to the complete, to the psychological integration of him or herself. All these people show symptoms of depression, derealization, insomnia, high anxiety, the physical sweating and trembling, deep personal helplessness and confusion. These are trauma responses. So, coming kind of towards the end, because I only have four and a half minutes. If we relate this back to the case examples, um, we see a mixture of both, of spiritual emergencies as well as traumatic stress responses. And I think it's really important to understand that there is both present and a mixture of them. Uh, all three people, I didn't give you the fourth example, were aware of the spiritual component of their experiences and <coughs> felt that they were meant to happen for their development, for healing, expansion of consciousness and their personal power. Nevertheless, in all the cases, this was not enough to counteract the traumatic stress response, which could, if not resolved, lead on long-term PTSD and much worse. If this goes on and on and on, you either have a breakdown or you, 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 it gets worse by itself. It doesn't usually get better. Therefore, ideally, everybody who facilitates integration should, number one, have experience in spiritual matters, number two, have experience in psychedelic, and number three, should be therapeutically trained and understand trauma. I think it needs that combination. So, talking a bit about uh, integration, and I'm whizzing through that because I have now three and a half minutes left. The ideal situation would, of course, be that we have holding environments, such as the indigenous communities provide. Ideally, we would have centers where people can go to, be looked after, given time and support to process. Generally speaking, because we haven't got that, even Karen back there is trying to, that's Karen, and hopefully we'll hear from her later, is trying to set something like this up. And I would really think that it's high time that the, the psychedelic community looks into that. Um, I'm getting enough phone calls, and so do others, from people who actually need help after experiences, and we don't know what to do with them, because we can't provide the space at the moment. So. If this is not the case, if we, as long as we don't have holding centers, uh, we need a kind of <coughs> therapeutic holding as the first step. And the first step is basically a phase of stabilization. As you said before, once this all breaks down and the emotional anxiety level is so high, it needs stabilizing. There's no sense in going into the psychedelic experience and going back there and fizzling it out. It needs a stabilization phase. So this is calming the nervous system because these are nervous system responses. Relaxation, uh, some exercise, anxiety reduction, and expressing at this state what needs to be expressed but not going too deep. So the therapeutic relationship needs to provide understanding, safety, and complete acceptance of the client's experiences, which you can only do if you have your own experiences in the background. 
you cannot accept because there's a different language, there's different images, there's different experience. If you never had one, how can you understand it? You can't. No. Um, the therapy has to provide a mixture of normalization, basically bringing across this is a transition phase which can be brought to an adaptive conclusion, whilst at the same time taking the symptoms seriously. One minute. Okay. So, okay, I'm not going through that then. So the next step would be basically an integration of the processes. So being with what's happened, connecting the images, feelings, memories, the subconscious, the conscious, the mental expression like talking, writing, drawing, emotional expressing, crying, shaking, shivering, anger, helplessness, the physical release, vital, I hope uh, that, you, that you will talk about that a bit more because this stuff is held in the body. It needs to come out and the spiritual and shamanic input, which we can do through journey, ceremony, working with spirit, allies, allies uh, and so on. One more minute and I stop. So I leave out the summary. Basically, no, I, I two, two words on it. The substance is the college catalyst and a teacher. This can lead to shadow encounters and some people experience a difficult aftermath. These states can be defined as transition states where the old breaks down and the new is not yet integrated. Mostly these states have a spiritual component and a traumatic component, really important. And they need to be processed and integrated. And I leave you with the last sentence. If processed adaptively, encounters with the jaguar, with that dark shadow force, with that which frightens us to death, will lead to transformation. The person will come through more whole, more conscious, more authentic, more powerful and purposeful, less enslaved to the ego, because a connection has taken place, more connected to self and spirit, and it should not, under no circumstances, hold us back from actually using in theory chains. Because as McKenna so rightly said, if the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness don't include the right to experiment with your own consciousness, then the Declaration of Independence isn't worth the hemp <laughs> it was written on. Thank you very much.